how do we come to be? How do we develop from a single cell buried in the womb, in our mother's wombs, into an embryo, a fetus, uh, an infant, and then finally in an adult? It's one of the great questions of biology. And in principle, the answer is relatively straightforward. We, that process is controlled by a program, a genetic program, something like a computer program, but one that runs on genes, in which there are cascades of genetic information in which one gene switches on another gene, switches on other genes, on and off, in ramifying networks, in which specify the different parts of our body. But how? All the information is there in our genomes. We've known it since 2001, when, our, when the human genome was sequenced at vast cost. Three billion dollars, I think it cost at the time. It was a great, great result. And there it was in front of us, as it were, the, the, the book for making a human being, the instruction manual. The problem was that the instruction manual was written in a language that we don't understand. It was written in Chinese, and assuming that you're not Chinese and can't read it. It's, and so our task as biologists has been to understand the grammar and vocabulary of genes. And the way to do that is relatively straightforward, brutally straightforward, actually. If you have 25,000 genes and you don't know what they do and you want to know what they do, you just start knocking them out, right? You remove one of them. The logic is, logic is exactly as if a Martian were to encounter a car. Uh, and he, the Martian wanted to know, how does the car work? So he begins, the Martian, to take the car to pieces. He, he unscrews something, right? And sometimes uh, he takes out a screw and sometimes a, 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 a wing mirror falls off. And the Martian says, well, obviously the purpose of that screw was to attach this thing, the wing mirror, to the car. Right? Sometimes the car just dies. And he's, the Martian says, well, clearly that screw was needed for the life of the car to have the thing work at all. Right? And that's exactly what biologists do. They knock out genes one after another in order to find out what they are, what they do, and they look at the result. Right? It's a sort of a reverse engineering approach. They look for mutations. And they engineer mutations. That's what they do. They do it in mice, they do it in fruit flies, they do it in worms. I used to study worms. That's what we would look for mutant worms all the time. But the problem is that, you know, you can do this for worms and flies and mice, but you can't really go around making mutant babies. I mean, you can't engineer humans, even if it were technically possible. It's just not. It's considered ethically unacceptable and quite right, too. So if we can't engineer mutants, what do we do? We have to go find them. And fortunately, because there's six, seven, eight billion of us on this planet, there's a lot of mutants. And indeed, the thing is that in a very profound sense, we are all mutants. It's just that some of us are more mutants than others. And that's what geneticists do, human geneticists. Essentially, they scour the world looking for these places where, for people who are unusual in some fashion. Maybe they've got six fingers on their hands instead of one. Maybe they've got their guts the wrong way around. Maybe they don't have two eyes. Maybe they've got a single eye in the middle of their forehead. There are Disorders, large and small, innumerable. I suppose the last time I looked, there were around 30,000, and this is a few years ago, 30,000 named genetic disorders in a, in a database which is maintained by the National Institutes of Health in the USA. 
and each of them is caused by a mutation in at least one gene. And these are very discrete kinds of disorders. They're the sort of disorders that you can identify discreetly and that are, that have, are inherited in Mendelian fashion. So I'm not talking about the complicated diseases like diabetes and heart disease and so forth. I'm talking about the, the things that are really strikingly passed down from one generation to the next in a dominant or recessive fashion. And, you know, we don't actually realize just how fragile the human body is, how fragile children are, how many of us are messed up in one way. And the reason is because there are so many diseases. And so we all, so many, so many people's children are wrong in one way or another, but we never actually count the burden of mutation upon ourselves. And it's immense. It's huge. Uh, when I contemplate it, I'm amazed that any of us turn out even remotely all right. But given that we don't, it turns out that it's hugely informative. It tells us about how the human body is built. Let me give you an example. There's an, a, a disorder called cyclopia. And cyclopia, it's named for Cyclops. You remember the, the, the monster of antiquity in, from Homer. They were a race of giants who built the great walls which the Bronze Age, uh, which were encountered in the Bronze Age. and uh, um, and they were, they were vastly greater than, vastly bigger than humans. They were giants, uh, and and they had a single eye in the middle of their foreheads, and and Wiley Odysseus kills one of them, but they crop up all over the place. And if you follow them through and from antiquity, if you follow their iconography, they come closer and closer, and smaller and smaller, and they come closer to home until finally they appear in the beginning of the scientific revolution in books of teratology, books of monsters, but these are books of actual babies that are born. Da Vinci, Leonardo, illustrates one of them, I think, at least it's attributed to him. And it's just a little girl who's got a single eye in the middle of her forehead who was born in Florence at that time. And they're still being born. It's a disorder that is now known more technically as hollum prosencaphaly, whole forebrain. Essentially, what happens is that it's not just a matter of having one eye located beneath the nasal cavity. And most of us have two cerebral hemispheres, but they have just one fused cerebral hemisphere. It's nearly always lethal, but actually there's a range of it. If you ever meet people whose eyes are just a little bit too close to apart, well, that's a weaker version of it. Or sometimes you can get people whose eyes are further apart, too far, somehow strangely too far apart. That's the opposite syndrome. So it turns out that the genes involved in several genes, the pathway, the molecular genetic basis of this has been identified and it turns out to be controlled by a gene called sonic hedgehog. Why is it called sonic hedgehog? Well, this is just molecular biology humor. There's a gene in Drosophila and fruit flies called hedgehog and it turns out that a, a relative of that gene was found in humans. So the molecular biologist called sonic hedgehog after the, the video game character Sonic the Hedgehog. But it turns out to be one of the most important genes. It's a, it, it encodes a protein that makes signals that work in all different parts of our bodies, but most especially, most famously, control the width of our faces. And that is why we have the widths. The reason that our faces are the widths that they are, and some a little bit more, a little bit less, is simply because of a gain or loss. Of, we have the right amount of sonic hedgehog signaling in our faces when we were an embryo. And if you experimentally manipulate this in ducks in, or chicks, you can, you can cause the face to expand and expand so much until it actually duplicates and you get, a, get, get two, two noses and two eyes completely far apart. Or in the case of a pig, a mutant pig that was found, you know, almost two complete... Complete face, completely separate faces, side by side. The pig was called Ditto. You know, Ditto, get it? Anyway, that's an example of how teratology, abnormality, disorder, tells us just one little part about how the human body is built. It tells us that these, this gene is needed for regulating our faces. And you can tell a thousand stories like that, you can, using what we are learning from human geneticists about all the genes that underlie all the abnormalities in the world, you can, 
use them to describe the genetic program that makes us, that makes a hand or any other part of our bodies. And although I spoke about mutants as other people, you should never remember, never forget that that's wrong, really, because the mutants aren't others. The mutants are us. We are all mutants. I have a, it is estimated, I estimated, and some years ago, and this has been borne out by more modern analyses, that on average, the average child, the average baby that is born, is afflicted with something like 300 mutations that cause it to be less healthy than it might be otherwise. So we are all riddled with them. Most of them, fortunately, only decrease our fitness or our health in small ways, right? It's only when they become really life-threatening that we actually notice them, that they become medicalized, that they become the kinds of disorders that I've spoken about. But the truth is, I think that the burden of mutation is one of the fundamental things that controls the way in, in which we, and how we perceive other people. What is the nature of physical beauty? What is it that makes one person more beautiful than another? I think, I cannot prove, but I believe, I hypothesize, that it's simply the relative quantity of mutations that we are born with. It's not that beauty is some positive value. It's not some positive thing, some special God-given quality. It's rather simply the absence of imperfections. And when we look at somebody's face, we, as it were, ask, well, relative to some ideal that we have, we sort of knock off points. He's bald. Ten points off there. Funny nose. Another ten off, and so on, and so on, and so on. And so that when we look at someone, it's not so much Stendhal said that something like that beauty is the recollection of... No, he said beauty is the promise of happiness. And I think that's true, but I actually really think that it is the, the recollection of imperfection and the things that are not there. I think... I speculate, I hypothesize that this variation in our mutational burden is also the essence of beauty, I mean of physical beauty. What is it about physical beauty that captures us, that takes us by surprise, that causes us to look? If, if I am right, it's not that beauty is a positive thing, some God-given quality that beautiful people have that the rest of us don't. Rather, it is simply an assessment of the absence of imperfections. We have, as it were, some ideal in our heads. We probably all have very much the same ideal. And as it were, when we look at someone, we ask, how far is that person from the ideal? And we take off points for every imperfection that they have. And when we cannot remove points, then we say, there is beauty. Stendhal said, beauty is the promise of happiness. And I understand what he means. But I actually really think that it is the recollection of sorrow. <laughs>